We talk uh, often about the question, is it evolution or is it design? Even the latest books of Steve Pinker says anybody who believes in the design is somewhere before the Aufklärung. Tonight I'm going to make a new proposal to make peace. And to make peace, we have to believe that we are in design. We're not in evolution. Evolution is something which will go on. Past week a book came out, Human, the evolution after humanity. Which is quite logically if we see what we are doing to ourselves. So we are not in evolution. The evolutionary part of us want to die at 30, want to die at 25. When you have given birth to children, then you can go away. So we are a design. But the point is, we are not a design of God. Although we want, some want it to be, or Allah, or Yahweh, or whatever spirit. I will propose that God and all these guides and all these gods could exist, but above all, the design is the design of us human beings. We are very shortly on this planet. If you take the Bible as the whole history of the world, you know the metaphor, then we live the past two pages, so we are very shortly here. And we designed this narrative we are in. And we designed it very poorly. Because we don't understand our evolutionary origins and our brains and our minds and all what's in it. So we are basically a fragmented walking bomb because we don't understand ourselves. But we keep on going, acting as if we are. If you look at intelligence, that is the question, why do we think? If we can think so intelligently, well, some do, and we sometimes do. If we can think that intelligent, intelligent there must be a reason in evolution that there is intelligence. Well, you know, sometimes in evolution, often in evolution, things are just a byproduct. So our thinking is just a byproduct. Why do we know this? Look at the octopus. You know, scientists try to make intelligence with computers, robots, etc., and it took them decennia to let a robot drink a glass of water. So what is that about robots? Then somebody said, let's start with the muscles. Let's start with five arms of the octopus. We make five plastic arms. We connect these neurons and they can just do what they want. And these five arms were moving like a real octopus and it became intelligent, but nobody intended to be. So let's face it, intelligence, what we have developed, is a very nice byproduct. So we are a byproduct. Maybe we are a parasite on evolution. And most parasites, they keep alive. So that's a strong point. But how did we came to this bad narrative? Most of you think that you are very, well, at least rational. I think most of the people will think I am a rational being. And if I would ask you, where is your I? Most would say in my thinking. And if I would ask you, do you have a body or are you a body? I guess most of you would say, I have a body. As the dancers would answer differently. But most people will say, I have a body. These are principles that you believe in, even you cannot do without. So I try to get tonight to get you to get rid of these principles. So it's a little bit deconstruction night. And in order to do this, it's very difficult because 
is as, it is as difficult as it is to stop smoking. Well, most people cannot smoke even after October. So what about getting rid of some thoughts? But if we do not get rid of our way of thinking, we will never have peace. Forget it. You can say we will, we will stop nuclear war, we will stop this, we will start empathic courses for children, and so on and so on. But the thinking we do has war in itself. So the thinking loves war. It needs the war. So I'm going to talk about this thinking. And I start with a very interesting philosopher, René Girard. And René Girard discovered exactly the opposite of what everybody thinks. Everybody thinks, I, especially in the Netherlands, we are all unique creatures. I'm an individual. I will be different than you. I have different haircut, different clothes, different manner, different opinions, and so on. So if somebody says something, I would say no. I would disagree because then I'm somebody. This difference between human beings has been completely eliminated by René Girard. He would explain why the twins we have at home would fight about the same toy. So we put two identical toys, the two boys come in, <laughs> okay, we have two toys, you can choose. Within one minute they fight about the same toy. So it's not about having resources. We want the same resources. How has Hirar explained this? Well, he worked on different novel writers like uh, Gustave Flaubert, like Proust. He discovered, which would be very painful for you, because if you think that you are unique, it's very painful. He discovered that our basic Arist anthropological instinct is to become the other. To become the other, as strange as it sounds. You want to become, you want to leave yourself behind and to become the other. And this is why we're not looking at a toy, but he wants to become the other twin bro brother, and the other brother wants to become the other twin brother. So it's a fight with no end. It's an incalculated war. He discovered that in the original tribes, people had solved this problem. Because we talk about twins. What about 100 students with no rules, with no limitations? They all want the same. Well, this has been translated into how we do romantic love. Some people believe in romantic love, which, of course, after 10 times, they don't believe it anymore, but they start believing it. And what he discovered, René Girard, and all those novelists, is when you, as a man, love a woman, woman X, Marie, you love Marie because David loves Marie. You won't believe it now, but I will assure you, if you're going to start reflecting about your past at school, you will say, oh yes, I can see something of that. So you love Peter because your girlfriend loves Peter. This is the tragic of the triangle of desire. And if you had in the, in the classroom at high school, maybe you remember, maybe you had thought, seen this, that all the boys like Noel, Noel loves Maria, so all the boys said, I also love Maria. You remember? <laughs> she remembers. And then you, Noel said, I don't want Maria, you can have Maria. And the second boy said, no, you can have Maria, and Maria doubled down to the ground. This is the tragic of the fight, the eternal fight, I want to become. So we see this, of course, in, in film industry, in advertisements, but also on small scale. So if I talk to 
to my lot older, a little bit older students of the University of Amsterdam, I always checked it and they were shocked. So I, I've warned them, the story I'm going to tell you will ruin your romantic love so you can go now out for 10 minutes and then come back. But everybody wanted to stay. And then they said, now I remember my girlfriend, she always fell in love with my boyfriend. <laughs> Somebody is laughing, I see this. So this is the drama of the human being. The drama of the human being is we have a very strange structure of desire because we think we want this, what we want is because David, uh, David Beckham wants it. What did, uh, so what happened in the, the, the first periods of mankind, everybody wanted to become somebody else and then came in conflict with that person because if I want to become X, I had to love the same thing X loved. And this is a very frustrated situation. If you have an enemy, you just kill him. But it's also your model. So you, you want to kill him, oh no, that's my model. And then you fall in love with his girlfriend or his, his friend or whatever. So this is the root of violence in ancient times. And this root of violence exploded, so this is a very interesting story, into the killing of a scapegoat. So the killing of the scapegoat, Freud also told us this already, is a sort of extreme eruption of jealousy, frustrated desire, not understanding your desire, and not having clear what are you. What happened then? The scapegoat that was killed caused a lot of fear in the tribe. And this fear is the start of religion. So he discovered that religion basically is a design by ourselves to limit our desires. Because after this killing, every year we have to ask for forgiveness. Every year we have to play the killing again. To remember, don't love your neighbors wife. Don't love the horse of your neighbor. We have it in the Bible, we have it in the Quran, we have it everywhere. But it was an intelligent design to stop the unlimited desire. So if we are again now in since the year 60 still now with unlimited life, you can see a lot of frustration into desire. Because we have no limits. We say we can live without limits. We are free. We are wonderful. No limits. I want to do this. You want to, okay, you want to put an iron nail in your head. That's what you want. If you want to marry a dog, that's what, if, you, if you want to marry yourself, that's what you want. Uh, this is a state of the first wild where desire will be exponential without understanding what we do. How did they solve this in the old tribes? You would only allow to desire some part of the society. So if you are the, 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 you can say, the layer of butchers, you will marry within butchers. So it's the standing society, the society of caste. We often despise very much, but that was their solution. So if we want another society that is not a caste society, we have to think of new strategies to limit our desires. If you, um, well, I can go over, but this is what I want to talk about, Girard, about the first analysis of desire. But if you look at everything which is going wrong in our society, in the northern western society, in the northern western hemisphere, it's all related to our ill-defined desires. So we have to analyze our desires. That's the only way to get out of the shit. You can solve the cocaine killings, uh, every, every cocaine, cocaine sniff implies uh, one killing of a child. You can stop uh, uh, using cocaine, but then something else becomes because you have then still the desire. So you will go to crystal bed, or you will go to more chicken, or whatever. <laughs> or whatever. Uh, but always our desires are the key of this 
strange, unstable situation in the world. The tribes had a stable situation within them, and they could fight against another tribe. But sometimes they also regulated these relations with other tribes because they found out that it was good to have wild breeding. So sometimes yeah, they exchanged men. <clears throat> you have all sorts of practice, also killing, you have women, um, uh, women who lead the tribe, Amazon, etc. I'm not going further into that, <clears throat> but the point that we are individuals, authentic egos with a unique brain is a false narrative. But it's worse, it's the cause of our, all our crisis situation at this moment, and the worst of all, that people go on using their brain. So they go and think things. We have to think more. If we think more in this way, we get more of this problem. <clears throat> so my plea today is, stop thinking in this way. So maybe you should dance, well that's all. Maybe some, something better. But we are completely in each other. We talked about otherness today. We are in one another. Our desire is designed by the other. Once I went to, to students of the Montessori Museum to the mountains in the Dolomite, and there was one student who ran upstairs always, and upstairs he was like smoking like this. And I said, OK. You run and then you smoke, is that not a little bit uh, tiresome? No, I want this, this is my love, my life and happiness. And then I thought, oh yes, he is copying James Dean. <laughs> so he was completely into that. And he was so happy to become James Dean. He had even his jacket, I saw, I, I, I was checking it on the, it was a James Dean jacket. So we are in the other, so let's face that. Stop being ego, stop being yourself. We could much better think collectively, then we don't need this whole uh, masquerade. <clears throat> but the point is, you will get very difficult from your thoughts. I will explain that in the next part, which is the next, uh, you can say, hard message. Why will you not get rid of your thoughts? Well, mostly we think that we are thinking. The first um, uh, error is that we think that we have a, that we think in our brain, and then we think that we are logical brains, and that we can make uh, evaluations and, and causations and what's all sort of stuff, and that is not true. We think with our body because the whole mirror system is a sort of floating machine from here till somewhere down, and all these neurons are active, and they make circuits. And they like to make circuits because that's what their evolutionary power was. If I make a circuit, that means I think something, I close this circle and that means neurons of eyes, of smell, of some words, sounds, muscles or whatever. If I make a circuit, it closes and it gives you free cocaine. We call it dopamine. But it's free, okay, it's not polluting and it's free. So that's why you like to think always the same. If you are in Amsterdam, you like to think Rotterdam is shit. If you like a Dutch, you like to think Germans are aggressive. If you see a German in a, a car, you say, wow, I'm gonna. You like that and you get dopamine. This is a very interesting thing that David Bohm discovered. David Bohm is also a physicist and philosopher, like me, but that is a coincidence. But he said, we cannot get rid of this world in this way if we not realize that we are not thinking. You can always notice this with your partner. You can observe your partner. He will always or she will always say this in situation X. Or maybe he will say this always. <laughs> Very intelligent people, which is the tragedy, will have very intelligent, addictive thoughts. So you can have a prime minister who's always saying, I only do what the facts tell me, which is a thought, it's an addictive thought. Or somebody else would say, I want evidence based about your child. I'm, if you say it's a good child, I don't care. I want evidence based. This is an addictive thought. Everything also that you think yourself that you are very intelligent 
or that you are very stupid. It's very interesting that negative thoughts about yourself can be very addictive. We have in Spain, where we, uh, Miguel and I have our practice, we, uh, we, get, we receive companies, business, governance, but also in or students of art academies of all, but also individuals who want to get rid of their thoughts. And why cannot, why cannot get rid of their thoughts? Because they are so deeply addicted. And why are they so deeply addicted? Because they always start when you are four, five or six. When you have no defense system, when you don't understand the world, when your senses are like completely fragile and somebody will say to you, you are as dumb as a football. Or somebody told me, a client, a teacher told me, you are a lantern without a light, which is the worst I ever heard about a teacher saying to a child, a lantern without a light. Then it came in the child. She closes it, she is so attached, so painful, touched by it, that it will provoke a very intense circuit. This hormone, cortisol, adrenaline, the whole shit. Because this is such a strong circuit, she gets a lot of dopamine. So she will rehearse this thought over and over again. But it is at the same time so painful that she will hide it. So she will act always very gay, very pleasant, very nice, hiding this painful assumption, we call this. Assumptions can be very... Most of us are steered by unconscious assumptions. And there's not one, because then comes the second one. You're ugly, another her girlfriend says to her, you're ugly. The child gets it in, and it's a, ne a next assumption, a next addictive assumption. So what does she do? Well, she will use a lot of mascara, and then when she has 18, she will use more mascara, and even a wig, and whatever, and very nice clothes. And she will always choose very simple studies, where you cannot fail. And when she was 26, she could tell this to us. Every one of us have these assumptions, but the point is that these assumptions are also connected with society assumptions. So the society, or say it culture, gives in you the assumption, okay, you are a boy, you can do what you want. You are a girl, watch your clothes, be nice, move gently, smile. Well, this deep assumption, and I know this from my students because they discover it after reflection on their stories and their youth. Wow, now I realize why I don't have self-confidence. They didn't give it to me. So sometimes I think it's an assumption of me that this society has a very simple mechanism and it works. You give the men overdoses self-confidence, you give the girls an underdose of self-confidence, so they always have a struggle and they need one another. Safe and no problems. Well, a lot of problems, but for them. So self-confidence in schools, I do a lot of, I work for the inspection of the, the, the Ministry of Education, visit all these schools in the Netherlands and it's horrible what teachers are unconsciously, it's not their fault, transmitted sort of assumptions to kids. You are just free and bio, you are from black, you are this, you are that, so you will stay there, I will help you. So, a black child counts, I will help you. A white count, then you don't say I will help you. If I say to a black child, I will help you, it assumes I need help. Everybody's helping that black, I mean black school kid. So I saw a beautiful uh, exam, a, blue, a beautiful different practice in Vlaardingen, in, in, in the school, the Geuze, Geuze College, where all these kids, different cultures, they were mixing really. You know why? Because the school dared to say, living together, you must learn. I don't say, 
oh, we, we organize nice things and circus and that that you may be integrated. No, you must learn. Why is this so important in my story? Because we have addictive thoughts. So if we don't put very rigorous measures on it, we will keep on in this circle forever. And the point is that we are worse off than ever. We have the Trump area, the Trump era, we have the Brexit era, and we have the increasing populism, which is very dangerous in Germany, and we cannot overestimate this. But if you look from this point of view, from the addictive thoughts to populism, then you understand a lot. Because it's the most relaxing, easy way of living. It's day. So this is a first step towards what if we really want to change our education with a radically huge change. That means that most teachers should be in training because most teachers are very addictive to the same stuff. But I've seen teachers who really engage with kids and that is really wonderful. This is really, Maxima was there and she was crying or maybe she's always crying, but she was really crying because she saw this happen. It was beautiful. So, can we explain why we have this stupid organized mindset? Well, like I said, we have addictive thoughts. To make it worse, we have also addictive feelings. So if you say, if somebody says to you, I feel that you are not okay, then she means to say, it's true that you're not okay because I feel it. You know that sentence? I feel this. Well, feeling is the same as thought, it's just an addictive felt. If you feel it again, you can say to yourself, really, okay, I, I feel this now, I want to feel different. And you will see it will, <laughs> if you train. You can train yourself when you have an addictive thought. Oh, there comes my partner, we are saying this, oh, I hate it. Oh no, can, do I want to think this? You can train yourself two questions. You can go to higher levels of your neocortex by asking yourself, do I want to think this? Do I want to feel this? So if you see a German car, do I want to feel this feeling of hate? If I see a Moroccan, do I want to think that it's aggressive? Ask it yourself. Or if you see somebody from Rotterdam, do you think that is a stupid moron? Ask it yourself. Do I want to think this? So what I'm really I'm proposing tonight is a sort of second level Aufklärung. And the second clear is, is also, uh, you will see after this talk, that it's also sustainable, very cheap, and most of all, it will make you real happy. Because our whole society tries to make you think that you are happy, but basically everything we do is based on, in the Dutch we call it leuk. As it leuk is, then it's good. Or we call it in English, it's pleasures, it's fun. So we are focused on pleasure. And why is that not okay if you are focused only on pleasure? Well, it's not okay because you will rob the half of the world from all its resources. Because pleasures will never stop. If you know it's from cigarette smoking, if you have smoked one, the only thing you want, you cannot enjoy it, you want the next one. And then you say, oh shit, I have to wait one hour for my pot. Okay, one hour, and then the next one. Children who get sugar, and in the Netherlands they are very aware, so most of the children don't get sugar, but if you give your child sugar, the only thing you want is more sugar. You're making the dopamine system of your child prone for addiction. So you're making your whole neural system of the child ready to engage in this addictive dopamine in society. Later on he got addictive to alcohol, drugs, Facebook, pornographic sex and so on. And that's in line with our economy because it's all need stuff to sell. So it's very good for the economy. And if you don't believe me, and you don't believe me because you're addictive to not believing this, but 
if you want to start believing it, there's a very nice book, and you can read it in one weekend. It's very exciting. The Hacking of the American Mind. A neuroscientist has devastating evidence that Richard Nixon started the sugar addiction in 1976 because the crisis of the farmers. He needed the farmers, so he got all the corn into corn syrup, and that's now in all your food. I have done, uh, because of my get rid of this addiction, I got, I'm in a keto diet for weeks or months, and when I enter Albert Heijn, almost 80% is not interested for me anymore because I have no insulin in my blood, so I say, that's all sugar. And then I ask, do you have something of not sugar? Oh, no. What a, what a strange question. So, this is a very hacking, first the sugar, and then we hack on Facebook, well, we know what, now, you don't know what Facebook hacks you, because they have, are further than we can know, because they analyze our hacking by artificial intelligence. So we stay in this neocortex, where is, as in this dopamine circuit, where is the dopamine circuit? Anybody knows? The dopamine circuit is in your brain, midbrain, so that's, you can say, the reptile part of your brain. So it's the strongest one, also with sex, hunger, and fear. So it's very exciting. So if you put your child on Fortnite, then he will be addicted with this reptile brain, very heavy. If you, get, if you close his Fortnite, beware, because maybe he kills you. Because that's the reptile. How come that we have this addictive system in our reptile system? Well, that's very simple. When we walk on the savanna 100,000 years ago, it's very important that you know that's a lion, that you get an addictive circlet. Lion means running. And, the, and that you don't see a lion and then analyze what are the colors, how, what does it smell, how is it? Ah, it's a lion. So the addictive thoughts are very important for survival. We don't need survival but we still act as if we have always, everywhere, lions. And it's connected to fear, so that gives extra. So it's how, how many, how strong the fear, how strong is the fear, how much we liked it. That's why it's increased in SM, but also children like fear, games with fear. If you look at all the video games, it's basically fear triggered. So this is a very stupid situation. And then we say we have to create peace. Well, forget it. It will get worse. But there is uh, something else. We have this dopamine circuit in the brain, but you can train it to get rid of it. But it's important to realize, and of course there are good things in dopamine, because eating, having love, and that sort of stuff, it's very important, because if you lack, then what's the sense of uh, living? But the dopamine is also connected to addictive thoughts. And one of the most important, net, you can say, on cultural level addictive thoughts is fatal abstraction. What is fatal abstraction? That is abstraction into Dutch, Netherlands, Catalonia, where we live, Spain. The concept of a nation is a fatal abstraction, which is so addictive, but it has no sense. Why should I kill somebody who says I am a German and I should not kill somebody who said I am a Belgian? What's the difference? But we do, since ages we do, we do this. So we don't recognize human beings, we say abstract is more important than the human being. You see what I mean? This is fatal abstraction. And this abstraction, discovered by John Dewey in 1920, but nobody listened to Dewey because they listened only to the stories they, huh, they want to know, like Thomas Hobbes, René Descartes. <coughs> but Dewey said this fatal abstraction is on every part of society. So we, you and I, we have poisoned by the idea that something which is abstract has more reality than just the experience of this person. 
Yeah, that's just you. They even say this in the Netherlands. Say, yeah, that's your opinion. Yes, I told you so. That's your opinion. But the abstract, that is something, wow, that's reality. That's why we call uh, our methodology Socratic Design, to get rid of this ab fatal abstraction and go back to the real thing. This is a human being. This is not a German or a Dutchman or whatever. This is Jan. This is Klaas, Pedro, Pablo, Maria, etc. This is a different challenge for humanity. Kant tried it years ago, ages ago. Every human being is the highest value. It's higher than a nation. We did not realize that project. Why? Because Kant did not understand human being in the sense that he thought that we were rational creatures. We are not. We are completely embodiment. So we don't need an Aufklärung. We need an Auf embodiment. So that is my proposal. Let's start to look at ourselves differently. And why is that? How is that possible? Well, start thinking sapere aude, which is what is the classical, the classical way of people get rid of all these dogmas and of all these things. But we now go a level deeper because we have get rid of the Catholic dogma, the Protestant dogma. So in the Netherlands we have no pillars anymore, no zuilen. We thought we are free. Not true, because the real dogmas are hidden underneath in our body. And if you really want to become free, you need some structure to free yourself. To be without limits, then you will be completely into fatal abstraction. I told you, one way is to think, why do I think this? Do I want to think this? Another way is to do I want to feel this? A very exciting adventure, and I know my client, we have, so, we have seen so immense, heavy transitions with person with, in San Clemente, but you can start yourself is by writing your narrative when you were, from the time you were four. And then writing your narrative, and then no say, oh, that was a bad time, I skipped that. And then go into the bad times, and then see the child, what the mother been saying, and what the father did, or what the teacher, and then say, what sort of assumption did the child conclude from that? And then you feel the pain, and you say, okay, I won't get rid of this. But the sadness is that mostly we keep this assumption alive, because they are addictive, and then we say, that's me. We we'll have now the problem of artificial intelligence. People say we are afraid that we get uh, copied by artificial intelligence, by robots. I tell you, it is perfect if we get copied by robots because that's the dumb part of us, the way we are till now. Automatic thinking. <laughs> but if we want to get ourselves like we could be, and some people have realized, and sometimes we have at moments that we realize, that is the real thinking. And how can we do that? Well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say some things about this, but first, uh, we're gonna listen to a poem by my partner Miguel from Ed Hornig, and it's a Dutch poet translated by Google and Miguel. They were written on the chalkboard at school. The verb to have and the verb to be. With those, time and eternity were given. The one reality and the other appearance. To have is nothing. War, not living. Having is from the world and from the gods. B 
being is raised above those things. Being is filled with divine pain. Having is heart. Having is body. Two breasts. Having is hunger and thirst for the earth. Just sentences. Only blunt duty. Being, being is the soul. Listening and giving space is to be a child looking at stars is being lifted towards it. So we talk about have and being. This is one of the most important transitions we can do. We define, you can say, the reptile creature in us by have. Have creates a lot of desires. The desires create a lot of turmoil, political, economical dis inequalities, and basically only more wanting to have. Can we stop having, is the question. Well, we do that sometimes. Because if you go to a museum, you don't say, I want that. You be with the piece of art for a moment. Well, some. You have also people who start continually thinking. Ah, this is that current, this is that uh, piece of uh, development, blah, blah, blah. But some people dare to be with a piece of art. I give the students of an art academy, that is some people of 60 or 70 or 12, the exercise you can do, there are a lot of trees in the, in, the, in the Hague, sitting in front of the tree, observing the tree, and try to become AI with no concepts in your brain. And you will observe, some people get really crazy because they observe, they cannot stop having thoughts because they are so addictive. But then realize this is the first step of getting liberated of thoughts. So watching a tree, because trees and humans have something special. I'm not going into that, but there's a philosopher in Germany discovered so many things about this. But believe me, it can happen, but you have to watch without concept. So don't say, don't say, it's like my grandmother, or it's so tragic. These are all concepts. Can you look at the tree without words? This is a struggle, and you can repeat it, repeat it, but it has to be one hour. And you write down what you happen, and you evaluate on yourself, and your system will reward you for doing this. And a certain, I have had students who could stop they are Ritalin because they were sitting in front of a tree. So it's worth while, but it's worth trying, but above all, empty your head with thoughts is what we need to do. That is the, you can say, the second level of Clairon, or the new embodiment. Get rid of thoughts, because thoughts provoke everything which is wrong in our world, and people will say, let's think more, provoke more of this. And if you don't believe it, then look at the things around you and then you will notice, I did not, never knew that this was a tree. I can assure you. Why not? Because you were looking at the thought of a tree. So you say, oh yeah, that's a tree. Oh yeah, that's a car. Oh yeah, that's a human being. Oh yeah, that's a gypsy. Oh yeah, that's a thief. That's this. So we, we look through a screen of thoughts. Thoughts is basically against the first Aufklärung. It's basically the cause, the root of a lot of 
misfits. And we saw that it's logic because it's addictive, but the cause is that the brain, the reptile brain, used to work on the tigers. Now our reptile brain works on the neocortex. Well, people still have neocortex, but a lot of people don't use it. And what is the neocortex that is causing some complex feeling, complex thinking, complex acting? It can be dancing, it can be music, it can be physics, it can be drawing, it can be whatever, being a very good client, being a very good client service, or can even be a very good taxi driver, when your neocortex is working. It's the highest level of humanity. But we don't use it. So we have a sort of spoiled reservoir of, you can say, not intelligence, but new enlightenment. And why is this so important? Because we found out that in the neocortex there is more serotonin. The exact relation is very difficult, but okay, that, we don't go into details, but if you play the violin or if you do some physics, like I did when I was studying and I was, when I got depressed, I started doing physics and afterwards I felt content. So that is the secret of the neurotransmitter endorphin when you use your neocortex. So when you are bored of feeling uh, like negative, start doing something neocortex endorphin related. If you don't know, because most young people, I see all those students in, in six schools this year, of this week, and ask, how many uh, hours did you on Facebook? You, 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 and it's about six, four, six, five, six, five. Six. It's the incredible reinforcement of the midbrain of the dopamine. And if you, and it's so beautiful, but nefastive, uh, very, you can say, disastrous, when you use your dopamine too intensely, all the transport system are occupied by dopamine. So you cannot use serotonin. And the point is you keep on staying insatisfied because you want more. So it's a so interesting, beautiful, negative mechanism. But if you manage to go in your neocortex, doing mathematics or doing the theater or cooking very complex or whatever, you will see, you will see, wow, I feel content. And people know this who do this. The point is, serotonin doesn't need pollution because you can do any complex activity for free. It is free. But most of all, it isn't addictive. So it makes you, in the next level, free of our reptile disaster. But how can we do this collective? We have to stop thinking in Netherlands, Germany, Brexit or Catalonia. Because these are narrowing concepts connected to the dopamine. But we should organize ourselves because the world is in panic. Populism is everywhere. So I would say we have, this is really true, a serotonin based organization, which is the EU. I don't know if you ever went in the EU. I went in Brussels to ask for educational program. I was astonished. Everything was value driven there. People wanted programs for this. Okay, is it this value? Well, this is high level, next level, Aufklärung. So we should organize ourselves, personally level, get rid of your dopamine, go into deep dialogue with other people. You have to learn it, but if you experience it once, you realize, we did it last time with a, a big organization, governmental organization, all conflicts one-to-one, -one, nobody listens, everybody has his own addictive thoughts. I always say to all these organizations, you can skip all your meetings, that's thousands, thousands of dollars, because nothing happens there. And they say, you're right. Why you do it? We are addicted to talk. But if you make a dialogue, 
we say sit together. We go in a Socratic dialogue, which is a very disciplined method, the Socratic design dialogue. We create, and this is the best word that I want to give you, collective attention. Collective attention means that we all together, like now, watching the same thing at the same moment in the same way. So if somebody is against, we don't say he is against. We said, we now thought it was A. Somebody said, no, it's not A. Okay, then we all go, it is not A. Oh, wow, that's also interesting. Let's make, how can we go to next step? So the secret of humanity, that was already known by tribes. <laughs> this is the animal. <laughs> the Schrodinger cat. The secret of tribes, they always were thinking you do only collectively, in collective attention. And you know what? If you have this meeting with somebody, you can sit for one hour silence, just silence, and you will see some things have been solved. Why is this? And this is the last thing, because we have to, uh, to make an end to this monologue. Uh, <laughs> Why is this? Uh, because if we focus on our togetherness, we become a sort of laser. Because the brain waves will go in the same rhythm and we forget our ego assumptions. So this collective attention is one of the strongest value, I would suggest, for peace. And you can make, and we have done that in very crisisful situation. You can organize this in every warlike situation because people were not allowed to fall back in their own addiction. Why? Because I would say to you, you have to repeat what he just said. And you will say, I don't know. You have to. And then you will focus. And then you will say, wow, I got this thought in my mind. It's not such a strange thought. You see what I mean? But then you are thinking anew. You are thinking in an explorative way. So we have to become, let me say, away from fatal abstraction into everyday being, like Edward Hornig said. And being means it's free, it's cheap, it's clear, it's healthy, and it's even more human than a dopamine reptile consumer trunk. <laughs>